Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. And let us just open with the word of prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing us all together at this appointed time. I give you praise. I give you honor. I give you glory for you are worthy of it all, Lord. If there's chains and stuff binding on your people that don't belong there today, I ask that you just break it off of each and every one. For it is nothing but a hindrance to them, Lord, and it needs to break off of them. I bind and I cast it out off of each and every person. It doesn't matter where they're at, they can be gone today. For they are not our portion, Lord. For you took the stripes on our back and died on the cross for us, Lord. So we don't have to go through all of that. We don't. We just need to give it all to you. Open the eyes, ears, and hearts of everyone listening. And let they may receive from you today what you want them to receive. And I will give you all honor and glory, Lord. And this I be with me as I give forth your word today. For it is not me, it is you. And I'll give you all honor and praise and the glory, Lord. And this I ask in your name. Amen. All right. I hope you all had a wonderful weekend. I know I did. Um, I was with church friends yesterday. We went, had Fall Fest at the pastor's house, went on a nice hayride, we just had a wonderful time fellowshipping with one another. It's getting a bit chilly out there for it's that time of year, but it's happening a little quicker than I would like anyway. So anyway, I want to talk to you today about the life of Joseph. The story of Joseph is given more space than in the book of Genesis than any other character. His birth is recorded in Genesis in chapter 30, verses 23 and 24, and is mentioned several times. However, we are introduced to him in depth starting at the age of 17. He was tending to his father's flocks, his father was Jacob, with his brothers, and that occurs in Genesis 37 too. I'm going to read a little bit of it to you. I'm not going to read six chapters out of the Bible. If you really want to know the story of Joseph besides what I'm giving you today, feel free to go back and read it and understand it for yourself. So he was in the, in the field tending to the flocks and with his brothers, and between this notice and the record of Joseph's death 93 years later at the age of 110, and you'll find that in Genesis chapter 50, verse 26. And we have details of an amazing life throughout those chapters on the life of Joseph. The story of Joseph is a tale of jealousy, deceit, slavery, misrepresentation, injustice, lust, rivalry, and forgiveness. It pits brother against brother. We encounter imprisonment and deep trials that do not produce self-pity and prosperity that doesn't provide pride, produce pride. Joseph's life encompasses all this and more. It shows God's sovereign hand manifesting itself in his pro pro providential care over his beloved children, bringing about all he has perfect, purposed. He was a part of a large and complex family, which you can find that in Genesis 31 to 36 also, covers the first 17 years of his life. These were his informative years, a part of God's prov providential work to mold him for the future 
he had for him. God was already forming Joseph's character for an exceptional sovereign purpose that no one in his family would understand for years to come. Out of the chaos of Joseph's background came a man God used as a stirring example of his grace. Even his brothers recognized a unique grace on his life, and this made him hate him even more. See, his brothers hated him because they knew his father, their father favored him more and loved him more than any of the other ones. And his father also made him a coat of many colors, which they did not like. It made his brothers very jealous. So they decided they were going to sell him into slavery. Joseph, he was taken to Egypt and eventually became steward to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials. Joseph's story is important it's a vivid representation of the great truth that all things work together for good to those that love him. I'm going to stop right there, and I'm going to go to, so you can understand what it is I'm um, reading here. I'll find it here in a minute and read it. What I just read to you was out of Romans 8.28. Joseph always seemed to do the right thing, most importantly, for the right reasons. The story teaches us about suffering. It becomes a really important part of the pattern of the suffering servant that God appoints to rule. The rule involves him descending into death on behalf of others so that through their suffering and death, they can be exalted and become a source of life to others. Joseph was a suffering servant. His mistake was bragging about his dreams to his brothers, which just intensified their jealousy and hated him and hatred for him. However, when he matured, he showed he had moral character to be a leader. Okay, here we go. In chapters 37, it says this. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than the rest, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it to his brethren and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaths in the field, and lo, my sheath arose, and also stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obstinance to my sheath. No, I don't think I said that right. And his brethren, it's the word I couldn't pronounce correctly, obeisance. And his brothers said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it to his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obedience to to me, And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? 
Shall I and the mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to this earth? And his brothers envied him, but his father observed a saying, and his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here I am. So in this passage, you see Joseph had two different dreams. So he bragged about them a little bit, and that was his weakness. So I'm going to share, there's eight leadership qualities of Joseph. Number one, principled. He had character, integrity. He was honest. He was tempted multiple times and resisted. Two, humble. The power and prestige of his position working for Pharaoh did not change him. Three, discipline. Joseph had the proper long-term perspective even while he was in jail for a crime he did not commit. Four, faithfulness. While in jail and through all the turmoil, he remained faithful to God and never wavered from his commitment to follow him. Five, grace. He showed his brothers grace and mercy for what they did to him, sold him into slavery. See, they were so jealous and so ups and hated him so much that they were actually considered murdering their own brother. And instead, they threw him down into a pit, and then there was people coming by, so they pulled him out of the pit and sold him to these people, and in return, he went to Egypt. Six is competence. He did his job with excellence, whether as a servant, an interpreter of Pharaoh's dreams, or the manager of the family's sheep flock. Seven, wise. He was wise beyond his years. He was 30 when he stepped into help, set up Egypt, prepared for the famine, demonstrated a seasoned perspective with decision after decision. Eight, strategic. Joseph was a planner. He instructed officials to prepare for the famine that was to come seven years of plenty, seven of famine. That was the dream that Pharaoh had had that Joseph interpreted. And he was in jail at the time of that. God had a purpose for allowing Joseph to suffer. By his own testimony, his sufferings, physical, mental, and emotional agonies, had been allowed by God so that he could fulfill God's plan, which was to save many lives. How did he show his faithfulness to God? He humbly served in prison and remained faithful in all he did. By his faith, he was able to interpret dreams. Even Pharaoh's was given a place in authority, second in command in all of Egypt. How was his faith tested? When he summoned a famine on the land, this is Psalms 105, 16 to 19. When he summoned a famine on the land and broke off supply of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them. Joseph, who was sold as a slave, his feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron until what he had said came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. So, there's another section in there where when he was Potiphar's assistant, Pharaoh's wife came on to him, and he, re he refused. This is part of his test that he was tested in. So she let it go. He let it go. Well, one day when he was walking the halls of the castle, or the palace, as it's called. She, they were by themselves, and she grabbed a hold of his cloak, and pulled, he again resisted her, but by this time, she had his cloak, and she lied. 
she told Pharaoh that he tried to seduce her and all these other things, and they had him thrown in jail. So then he spent, I don't even remember how many years in jail, but he in started interpreting people's dreams. The cupbearer, he said that he would end up dying, and the other one went back to serving in the palace. So then Pharaoh himself had a dream, which was the seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. So that's what Joseph interpreted the dream as. So then he became Pharaoh's right-hand man, it's the second in command. He was put in charge of doing certain things. So lessons to be learned. God's plans and purpose are far greater than our own. God provides and blesses those who persevere to follow him. Three, suffering to God's people are not always a bad thing. God can use the most painful time of our life for his good. That's what's happening with me. There's things that happened to me as a child and even as an adult that God's now going to use for his glory. I've already forgiven people for what they've done. And it's not in my heart anymore. I don't harbor resentment. I don't harbor any anger or bitterness towards those people. But God's going to use that for his glory. And I'm going to go help other people who have been through the same thing. So when it says suffering for God's people is not always a bad thing. No, it's not. Because God will always take that bad and turn it for good, if you allow him to do so. Four, there's value in self-control living in the do-whatever-you-want culture. Five, God honors patience and perseverance in times of trouble. Even if you're going through a lot of trouble, just be patient. Persevere and be patient. It will work itself out. You just have to trust and rely on God. Six, strive for honesty and strong work ethics. They are sadly missing these days. I hate to say it, but most young people don't have a good work ethic. They're far and few between because of how this world has turned. They all want to do their own thing. They want to demand respect, but they don't want to give it any. That's not the way it's supposed to be. You're supposed to respect your elders and your parents, and it doesn't matter what they've done, you're still supposed to respect them. There's something, seven, there's something to be said about the fear of the Lord and faithfulness to him. Even though your life might suck right now, do you have courage to trust God despite your current circumstances? So it doesn't matter what your circumstance is. Are you going to trust God and trust what he has for you is good? He won't steer you wrong. I've even went through troubled times, but I didn't turn my back on God. I kept going. You have to keep pressing in and keep pressing in until you get that breakthrough. It is coming. Most people give up when it's all but there. Don't give up. Don't give in and quit. Keep going. Keep plugging away. Your answer and whatever it is you're looking for is right around the corner. So th then, then there's lessons from Joseph's life itself. One, the faithfulness of God. God is always faithful to you. It may not seem like it. Sometimes he's quiet. Sometimes he's not. But he's always there. You have to reach out to him. If he's that quiet, reach out to him. And it's through prayer. Just talk to him. It's not that hard. Two, 
the faithfulness G Joseph had towards God. That's what we have to do. We have to be faithful towards God ourselves to get the breakthrough. God is honored by our faithfulness. Three, a relationship with God. He craves that personal relationship with each and every one of us, including myself. Good stewardship. What are you doing with your time? Do you go out and tell people about Jesus? You can't tell people about Jesus staying at home unless it's on the phone. But go out. When you go to the grocery store, when you go shopping to the mall, let somebody know that Jesus loves them. If you see that they're going through a hard time, give them a hug. Sometimes that's all people want. It, maybe it's just a hug that they need to make, give them a smile. A smile goes a long way. People crave these things anymore. The provision of the Lord. God will always provide for you. Forgiveness. We can't keep unforgiveness in our hearts, folks. We have to forgive. If somebody has done you wrong, forgive them. And it's not for their benefit. It's for your own. It's for your own good to forgive. And without it, it God will even tell you, if you don't forgive, then what, what makes you think I'm going to forgive you? I can only forgive you if you forgive. Wisdom from God. If you don't have it, seek it. It's a gift that we're all allowed to have it. You have to seek it. Ask for it. We have not because we ask not. If there's something you desire from God, and, it's in, and that desire has to be in alignment with God, you can have what you ask for. Forgiveness enabled Joseph not to seek revenge and become bitter and angry, which you'll find that in Genesis 50, 19 through 21. Let me just go there. Okay, 50, 19. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore, fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones, and he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived a hundred and ten years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were brought up unto Joseph's knee. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being a hundred and ten years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Forgiveness caused Joseph to become a loving and caring person. This was a special blessing from God. Loving forgiveness will prevent a person from seeking revenge that will hurt people. Joseph's test in the Bible, Joseph had to be tested, and it was a test 
of purity. He fled temptation. He didn't flirt with it. And he went to prison for it before going to the palace. Purity is the way through prison to the palace. So it, the, the moral of the whole story combined, Joseph went through all of this and his, his dreams ended up coming true. He, his brothers and his father did eventually serve under him and they did all bow to him. And it was through the famine for in their, they were living in the land of Canaan when the famine hit and they ran out of food and had no choice but to go to Egypt. So Jacob sent his sons, all but one, and that was Joseph's younger brother, Benjamin, and they went there to get food. Now they didn't recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognized them. And he asked about his father and of his younger brother. And he told them that when they, if they came back, they had to bring the brother with him. Now, Jacob didn't want to let the younger lad go with them because of what happened with Joseph himself or what he thought happened to him. But see, Joseph didn't die like the father thought because the brothers lied to the dad and said that wolves came and ate him. And they put fake blood, all, they put an animal's blood all over his coat of many colors and took it back to their father. And the brothers, when they all did come together, they thought Joseph would hate them for what they did to him. But he didn't. He had already forgiven them in his heart. So that's what... That's what this means. He had to be tested. He had to purify his heart and get rid of any anger, bitterness that he had for them. And he also had to be tested in all these other areas, which he did. He went to prison for a lie, for a crime he did not commit. He didn't do anything to Pharaoh's wife. So Joseph went through all of that to realize his exaltation was solely the work of God and not as himself. So God will exalt us from things of our past and bring us up, raise us up. He's right now, he's raising up a remnant army and that's taken Simple people, people you may not think deserve to be raised up. But he's using those people with the past to reach the lost. Like I can reach certain people that you can't reach. You can reach people that I can't reach. But he will use you if you allow him to use you. I'm going to read to you one more scripture, and it's James 1. Starting in verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and unbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, wavering nothing, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, 
because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. I'm going to stop there. So, there you can see, if you need wisdom or any other, if you need more faith, you need wisdom, ask the Lord, he will give it to you. But you have to stand firm in it. You can't waver. It says here, do not waver, for it brings sin. And with that, I will ask you all to bow your heads, close your eyes, and I'm going to give an altar call. If you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or if you have, but you have backslidden, or three, you are saved and the enemy is lying to you, I want you to raise your hands, and I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Wash me, cleanse me, make me new. Thank you that you died on the cross for me and that you're coming back again for me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me a boldness to tell others of you and give me a passion for the things of God. Now, if you've said that prayer, I would like you to contact me. And you can find me on most platforms of social media. Reach out to me. I will pray for you. I will help you find a church. But don't just say the prayer and then leave it go to the wayside. You've got to plug in somewhere and make sure it's a church that teaches all of this, not just some of it or bits and pieces. It has to be a church that believes in the whole Bible, all of it, for it's all God's word. And that is where you will find your strength. It's where you will gain your prayer life. It's where you will gain your faith, your wisdom, your knowledge. It will all come to you through this. Through this word, you will find all of it. Any answer to life's questions you may have, you'll find answers in this Bible. Look for them. So again, I encourage you. Please find a church to get into. And if you said this prayer, reach out to me. Thank you and have a blessed day.